We have been studying Ephesians together. We've been working through Ephesians 2, thinking about how we have been separated from God. The first part of Ephesians 2, and then how we have been separated from one another, particularly along the the divide of Jew and Gentile. That divide being actually constructed by God, who put up the wall of the old covenant, the old law. And that in Christ we have been brought back to God. And in Christ and through him we have been brought back to one another. And therefore there is this union that we have as believers. In that context I wanted to take... This evening, and I wasn't planning on it, but this is part one of what was originally supposed to be a one-part sermon, and now is a two-part sermon. And y'all are all thankful, because I guarantee you, you would be missing football tonight. Oh, I didn't say that, did I? But I've entitled this, The Biblical Answers to Ethnic Divides. Now, this is not... The total answer, and tonight really isn't even going to dive in, in and of itself. We live in a day in which ethnic and cultural division and anger and upheaval and lawlessness, it's all over the place. We've seen it here in America because most of you have lived through a time where this was a lot verbal but not violent, whereas people tell me, oh, this is the worst I've ever seen. Well, is this this the worst you've ever seen? No. I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee during the race riots in the late 60s. That was really bad. And, um, And what happened during that period of time, and which was phase one of this major cultural revolution, And furthermore, we live in this sort of funny pressure cooker where the pandemic has exposed many pent-up angers and frustrations. And all it took was a couple of, yes, unjust, unwise, foolish actions to just light that up. And deep resentment in black communities... And other minorities over real, perceived, and sometimes exaggerated grievances. It's out there. Now, before we get too far into this, and we think that for some reason that this is unique to America, if you think that, you would be totally wrong. I have never been in a country yet where there is not some people group hated. So it's a fact. Chinese hate the Ugyars. Tribal warfare, tribal division, tribal hatred in Africa, all across Africa. Just watch Hotel Rwanda sometime. Don't do it before you go to bed. In India, it's religious as well as cultural, and go on and on and on. So before we think that we are in some kind of weird, unusual cesspool that doesn't exist anywhere else, not hardly. You can, Tim, Tim Reck can attest to this. There are villages in Romania where the Romanians live on one side of the main road and the gypsies live on the other. It's that kind of thing. I was walking through Bucharest in the beautiful Parisian uh, plaza with all the fountains, and I was walking with two gypsy men, one on either side of me. Romanian walked up to me and spat on my shoes because I was with these gypsy men. And so suspicion and hatred, irreconcilable differences in cultural and political realms, have led to dangerous levels of rhetoric, to violence. It's very interesting to me how often it is that what you believe was wrongly done against you, you turn right around 
and wrongly do against others. And we need to be really careful as Christians dismissing that till you've lived through it, till you've sat on the end of it. Although we didn't see much of this, I grew up as the opposite minority, right? I mean, there were six whites on the mission station I lived on. And the Simbas, when they came up out of the south trying to overthrow Maputo, they were, they were just killing whites because they were white. Missionaries, cotton farmers, Afrikaners, doctors, running hospital stations, and just, they were white, slaughtered them. So we need to be really careful that as we as Christians talk and think about that, that we also don't think, well, you know, the church is different. Oh, really? 1982, as associate pastor in a church in Sandusky, Ohio, as a result of just some evangelistic efforts, Black couple came to know the Lord, joined the church, younger couple. He was a construction worker. Wonderful couple, grew quickly, got sent down into um, Deep South in Alabama by his construction company. Um, I think they were working on some hurricane weather-related stuff. He went down there, ended up going to be permanently there. So we were corresponding and helping them to think about church and finding a place of worship. They finally found one that was similar to what we were at the time. And we encouraged them, go ahead and try to, go ahead and join. Never dreaming, right? So we get this really sad letter. It says, you know, we went down front, asked to join in the church, my wife and I, to move our letter from our church in Sandusky. And they said, we don't allow black people to be members of this church. So before you go point your fingers out there, we need to be very, very careful about ourselves and how we think about who we are and what we are and what we identify as. I know it's become a joke, but I often say I'm probably the only true African American in just about any room. To amplify all of this are the lovely social media platforms. Now, I know I have a pathological hatred for them. Too bad. They have become megaphones for amplifying the voice of extremists in just about every area of culture. It doesn't matter whether it's the extreme of Marxism and BLM on one side or QAnon and all of the weird, strange mythological conspiracies on the other hand. Those things would simply not have the voice that they have if it weren't for the social media platforms. Who, of course, you know, have the right to censor whoever they want. Just interesting who they end up doing that to. And now... I'm just very worried that in this culture and in this situation, in this time, the church is being driven by even good men into compromising the gospel with misinformed and misaligned social justice agendas. And then the response to the pandemic by many governmental authorities has created a terrible provocation for unsubmissive and rebellious hearts to think and to act in ungodly ways, and sadly even in the church. But good news, I don't know if you saw. Did you see this week? Governor DeWine signed um, a bill, legislation here in the state of Ohio, where they cannot close churches again without legislative action. The governor nor the health department, nor anyone can close us down again. So, thankful for God's mercies. So one of the questions that we, I and the elders, sometimes get, well, how do we respond to these things? For example, how do we respond to BLM? Just as an example. It's huge, right? 
everywhere you go. Well, first, let me make you a suggestion. Rather than me giving you an answer, go to their website. Just go to their website and read what they say and who they say they are. If you really want to get scared, you want to be really interested, drill down through their links. Follow their links. I would suggest maybe doing that in an in-private session. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't do it. And the response to BLM as a movement is easy. Because the injustice that many minorities have suffered has been taken over by Marxists who are trying to overthrow the cultural norms and mores under which we live. When you read there, you will find they are anti-God, they are anti-Christian, and they are openly anti-family, at least nuclear family. But what about the unjust treatment of blacks and minorities? And I'm going to lay a foundation here that at first might peer pretty far away from where you would kind of like for me just to go right now. But without it, you won't have the theological grid, grid work and groundwork on which, in which to wrestle with these questions. And so we'll be speaking to that as a part of this sermon and others like it from the book of Amos. We will be taking up in late winter and the spring of 2021. One of the questions that get asked is, so what's the church's responsibility in all this? Shouldn't the church be at the forefront of changing the culture to address these injustices? My answer would be largely no. Not in the way that is being advocated by many in the so-called Christian social justice movement. In the midst of this, I want to emphasize a biblical order of spheres. We are, as Christians, first and foremost, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. That is first, foremost, and primary. Secondly, we are second members of a local church. Thirdly, you are citizens of a country. Most of us are citizens of the United States. At least one of us is a citizen of more than one country, but that's okay. Now, what I want to do tonight is I want us to look at some scriptures, and at the end we'll draw some general conclusions, and then in... Uh, next sermon, the next part of this, we're going to go into more areas of detail, detail about areas of equality and social justice, cultural change, and our responsibilities as Christians and as a church. Now, also let me say something. I've um, been doing quite a bit of reading in this, and sometimes people who are talking about what the church ought to do in and of itself, their quotes are being taken out of, out of context, and it makes them look as though they're talking about something in the broader world that they're not. Now, brothers and sisters, among Christians, this simply ought not to be, but too often is. Don't do that. Even if you disagree with someone, make sure that you are representing them accurately. So let's begin tonight with a focus on a general response from biblical theology. Now, how many of you could have guessed that I was going to do a biblical theology tonight? Yeah, that, I mean, if you know me at all, yeah, we're going there. And so uh, I have just a series of statements that are sort of summaries of two or three texts. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. First and fundamental to thinking about the biblical answer to ethnic and cultural divides is this. All humanity 
were created by God in his image, male and female. God created them. Just for point of reference, Genesis 1, 26 to 27, then God said, let us make man in our image. The word here does not refer to a male. It refers to human beings. Let us make humanity in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man or humanity in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. All human beings, regardless of present color, ethnicity, and language, were all made by God through special creation. God created Adam and Eve, the first human beings, in his own image, equal before God as person and distinct as male and female. God created human beings in two genders, male and female. We we deny that the divinely ordained differences between male, male and female render them unequal in dignity and worth. We are all, male and female, created in the image of God as image bearers. Secondly, all humanity is descended from Adam and Eve. This is a fundamental assertion. Nearly everything that you see in race and culture and ethnic divides today is a direct byproduct in the Western world of evolution. Genesis 4, verses 1 through 2. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. Now go to Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. These are the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness. After his image and named him Seth. Now that is very important. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters, and thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. What would you do for 930 years? So all of humanity was created by direct creation by God, and... All humanity is descended from Adam and Eve, and we bear the image of Adam. We have this common ancestor in whose image we are conceived. This includes our humanity and our depravity. All people born of a human father are innately sinful and are separated from God. Therefore, all people born of a human father share a human, common humanity and depravity. There is no essential innate difference between human beings that can be called race. Now, several times I'm going to say in this, born of a human father. Why do I say that? Because there has been one human being who was not born of Adam, Jesus Christ. And so he does not bear the image of Adam in depravity. He receives his humanity from his mother. And so it's very important to say, one way or another, that Jesus is not born of a human father. He was, in fact, virgin-born. 
Thirdly, we would assert that the present diversity of language and culture are the result of the direct hand of God in confounding human language and thus creating human cultures. Turn with me to Genesis 11. Now you see what we're saying? Let this build. And by the way, this is the way it builds through the Bible. I'm just following Genesis, right? All humanity created by God in God's image. The fall happened, and Adam begat his sons in his own image, transmitting to them both his humanity and his depravity. Genesis 11, 1 to 9, now the whole earth, this is after the flood, of course, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest, now notice their purpose, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people. And they all have one language. Notice the connection. One people because of one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing they propose will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. God divided the world physically and culturally after the worldwide Noahic flood. Humanity, through Noah, had been commanded by God to multiply and to fill the earth. Implicit in filling was going. That is, they were to spread across the face of the earth. And they did not do so. And they attempted to reach back up to the false gods of the pre-flood era by building a city and a tower. And as a unified humanity with a single language, God recognized the great danger in exponential growth in knowledge and skill and power. In order to dilute this, and to accomplish other purposes and plans, God replaced the one language in everyone's soul and mind with different languages. <laughs> in one short period of time, I, I, my guess is this is overnight. You went to bed speaking English and you woke up the next morning speaking German. Hopefully God was gracious and so all your family was speaking German as well. But in some short period of time, people suddenly not only began to speak, but began to think in a different language. Now, they were self-aware, and they, they knew what that language meant, even though yesterday they couldn't do it. It didn't even exist. Now it exists. And that's what happened. Most people think in languages, and language forms the basis for culture. And God had diversified humanity, he slowed the development of science advancement, and he caused through this the great migrations that followed. So, the present diversity of language and culture are the result of the direct hand of God in confounding human language and thus creating, over time, the various cultures we see today. 
Next principle. The historical migration and localization of cultures and nations are the result of the direct hand of God after the flood and down through history. Look at Genesis 10, verse 32. Genesis 10, verse 32. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now turn to Acts 17. And we get a clear New Testament understanding of God's redemptive historical purpose in dividing up the languages, creating the cultures, and spreading people throughout the world. Acts 17, verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. As I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place. You see what he's saying? God created one man. All the nations have come from it. He has allotted them the period of time in history in which they are to exist. And he has allotted them the boundaries in which they are to live. Why did he do this? Verse 27, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is, not actual, he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even one of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Humanity did not begin and spread from Africa. Common myth, commonly taught, all kinds of anthropological and cultural assumptions. Humanity since the flood spread from where? Originally? You can talk to me, it's okay. Huh? Where did the ark land? Mad Ararat. And then they drifted eastward to Mesopotamia. And so all of humanity came not from northern Africa or even central. They came from, from the Middle East, from Mesopotamia. Interestingly, when you study linguistics and you track how languages have developed, uh, it's, how it, it's very obvious, the development of language. And you have these outliers that are hard to understand. How did those languages simply pop up out of nowhere? Well, they didn't. The Bible tells us that in the days of Peleg, whoever that was, that, the, that God divided or separated the earth. We don't know if that was a physical separation in which up until that time there was a one continent and then it broke up due to the, the, econ- the weather conditions after the flood and the abating of the waters and so on. 
I'm trying not to get too deep into this because I love this stuff. God had determined and had caused those migrations to take place according to his plan for redemptive history. Now the development of the people groups around common and shared languages and their migration, their movement, and localization, their settling down in different parts of the world began when either the land masses were either joined or at least connected in some way. However it happened, we know, according to the Apostle Paul, that God determined it and God caused it. Yet, it also happened in a humanly explainable way, right? People who are speaking common languages would tend to clump together and would tend to migrate together. And so people would clump together according to a shared language and then as population growth and post-flood climate change pressures forced people to do what they should have done in obedience to God. The present ethnic, cultural, linguistic or language and even physical features are all the result of early migration, that is the movement of people groups, and localization, that is the settling of people groups. One of the results of this was more and more to isolate the genetics for most of the physical distinctives that are attributed to, to race. For more information on this, there's a lots of good materials at both ICR, Institute for Creation Research, and at Answers in Genesis. Both of these have done extensive studies on the movement of genetics, the isolation of genetics, and so on. Way beyond what I should do here tonight. Therefore, as a result of these texts, we believe there is only one humanity created in God's image, created in two genders that are now reproducing in Adam's fallen, marred, and sinful image. We believe that all people born of a father are fallen, innately sinful, and are separated from God. Ephesians 2. Diversity of languages and people groups, nations, ethnicities, and cultures, and physical features were determined by God according to his plan for redemptive history. What we call culture, the Bible calls the world. The diversity was designed by God and was disfigured and corrupted by sinful people. Romans 1, so that all cultures are sinful, but not equally so. Some cultures are superior to others in that they have cultural mores and laws that more clearly reflect the moral will of God in their consciences and in the scriptures. Further, sin is the root of of all division, conflict, hatred, injustice, and evil against others. James 4, 1 to 4, causes quarrels, and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder, you covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask, and you ask and do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Adulterous people do not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Now, we've preached on James here enough for you to know that the, the aim of that text is that conflict within the church. But the underlying principle holds true across all peoples. At the root of all conflicts and quarrels and fights, whether personally, culturally, or nationally, are wants and desires. These wants and desires function as idols and masters. This is true in the church to whom James was writing. It is true in the world. All hatred, injustice, revenge, and murder 
are rooted in sin. Sin, not culture. Sin, not race. Sin, not skin color. Sin, not injustice. Sin, not economic theory. Sin, not political position. Sin is the underlying cause from which all these evils come. Listen to what Paul writes in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh. Now remember that for Paul, the flesh is not only physical, but it has to do with the this world, the world of the old creation, the fallen world, the world under a curse. So it's something more than just your body. It is the world system. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Just in case I didn't name them, it's things like these. (laughs) I warn you as I warned you before, that those who do, meaning keep on practicing such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Therefore, in the world, brothers and sisters, all this trouble is normal. We do not live in the Garden of Eden. We're not in the new creation. As much as people are trying to create a new utopia, they want to create a perfect world without God. All of this should be restrained and punished by law. But sinful men exercise the powers of the law, and often unjustly. And in all of this, we are called to be salt and light. We as Christians ought to be different among ourselves. And sadly, and terribly, too often, we are not. The church can be just as polarized, just as unjust, and just as divided as the world around us. Finally, this principle, all cultures and societies tend to decline religiously and morally. Large section of text from Romans 1, verses 18 through 32. But I want you to hear this in the context in which we are speaking. I want you to remind you, to whom is Paul writing? To the church where? Rome. Who ruled the world at the time? Rome. Who was the emperor? Probably Nero. Think about that when you're picking up the book of Romans. Here, is God, here are God's people in the capital, basically, of the world. Trying to serve God and walk with Him. And here's what Paul writes. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived. Excuse me, somebody's trying to call me. Yes, God. For his invisible attributes, eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. By the way, notice that that is a time word. Since the creation, not by the creation, as it is often misread. Since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. And claiming to be wise, they became fools, being exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie 
and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. The women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They are full of envy and murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Now, this text is both a summary of the history of the world and an overview of what happens to cultures and nations. Both begin with some knowledge of God that is embedded in the conscience and in the culture itself. Then there is a cycle of ever greater sin with God handing them over to greater punishment using their sin to punish them. In this cycle, God's punishment is to hand them over to themselves and to hand them over to deeper sin. And once a culture or a people reject what they do know of the true God, then it will generally sink into ever deeper expressions of depravity and darkness. One of the things we need to realize in our world today is that there are many, many, current people groups and cultures, small tribes, who are not at the beginning of culture, but they are the product of the collapse of culture. So what is our general response then from biblical theology? People treat each other the way they do because of sinful beliefs and wicked desires in the heart. The problem is not race and gender and color of skin, country of origin. The problem is deep-rooted sin in the heart that causes sins like hatred and violence and stealing and destruction and murder. This is true whether you have black skin or a blue uniform. If what you do is evil, it's not your past history, it's not your present circumstance that is causing it. Oh, it may be an occasion for it, you may be tempted in it, It may be a provocation, but evil acts come from hearts that are ultimately refusing to love God and love neighbor. And so in both of these, I want to conclude with Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, the will of God that is good and acceptable and perfect. It is so easy to be shaped by our culture and not even know it. And Paul, in Romans, think of that traverse in Romans 12, says, don't allow the world to pour you into its mold, in your thinking, in your desires, in your values, and in your actions. And God grant that we here at the chapel will think about this in a way that takes Ephesians 2 and says we are united to God and we're united to one another. And though all these Differences exist. We refuse to allow them to divide us so that we welcome all. Let's pray. Father, it's half a message. We're in the middle of things. Possibly easy to be misunderstood. But I trust that to you. 
And I pray that you would cause us to think carefully, to be so careful that we do not allow the world to pour us into its mold, either by adopting the world or just trying to be different from the world. That's not what you said. We can be shaped by the world and become a caricature of the world. We are just its opposite. It's not the biblical way. We are to think differently. And so, Father, through these assertions, may our hearts be prepared. May our thoughts be shaped. May our faith be built so that we will value, we will treasure, and we will pursue your great kingdom among all the nations and among all the people groups. And we thank you that one day, before your throne, people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation will bow down and call you Lord. Hasten that day.